We're back here at the National Firearms Museum at NRA headquarters in Fairfax, Virginia. My good friend Phil Schreier, senior curator of the National Firearms Museum. And this time, Phil, you've snuck us into the Peterson Gallery in the living room right under the nose of everyone, including, including the people running the museum. We're in here and people are going through the museum and having a great time in here taping segments for the Curator's Corner. I just love it. Next time I'm going to have a little coffee service for us and we'll have lunch in here. How about? We could do that. <laughs> we could also now put the banner tag at the bottom that says film before a live audience. <laughs> <laughs> our live student <laughs> audience here, our captive audience here at the Fires Museum. Right. Now, you promised something, well, you always bring something special, Phil, but something extra special this week. If I remember correctly, what do we have for this week's Curator's Corner? Well, to the untrained eye, John, this would look just like another Civil War period carving. And in fact, s collecting Civil War carvings uh, is a collecting uh, niche that's uh, fairly popular. Uh, there were a lot of different carvings used. Uh, you have to remember that when the uh, war between the states broke out, there was such an, a rush to arms uh, that so many hundreds of thousands of, uh, of soldiers uh, needed to be armed that the government couldn't just say, well, uh, give everybody uh, some Model 1862 uh, uh, Sharps rifles right. or Sharps carbines or whatever, uh, because they, they could only make so many in, in any given day. They, they, they could not keep up with the man. Factories working flat out to get whatever they could. Running three shifts just to produce what they could. Right. That wasn't enough. So uh, what they did was instead of adopting one standard arm uh, for cavalry units like, uh, like the Sharps carving, right. uh, they had to go to various manufacturers uh, not to get them to make copies of, of the Sharps or whatever they decided, but to actually produce more of what these guys were already trying to sell. Uh, so they kept, you know, a dozen factories going, making a dozen like different a, types a of guns. A similar type of gun. Right. Right. Now, in some cases, we found out with, like, the Smiths, uh, these guns, they made them so uh, fast, but they got to the, you know, fight so late, they were just kept in boxes. The government bought them. They had contracts, oh. contracts, but uh, you know you find a lot of them in unfired condition. That's because they never, never were issued. Uh, but that's not the case with this guy. <laughs> um, this is called uh, the Burnside Carbine, uh, and it was very innovative for its time period because this was actually invented, patented, and uh, put into production. Uh, four, five years before the Civil War started. Wow. Uh, and the neat thing about it, even though it's percussion, you see the percussion cap or a, a cone there, right. it is a breech-loading uh, carbine that takes a self-contained metallic cartridge. Oh boy. Now, at the time this was happening, there was only one other gun that was doing that, was the Henry. And uh, the Henry's got a great deal of you know, positive press. Mm -hmm. This, the Burnside carbine, uh, named after its inventor Ambrose Burnside, uh, doesn't garner uh, that kind of same, you know, kind of first in the field uh, type of, of press. Uh, it's a very n unique cartridge. I wish I had one here to, to show you, uh, but it looks like a, a miniature, uh, you know, a torch. Uh, it's got a tapered uh, brass uh, casing to it, mm -hmm. which has a little pinhole at the base of it. Now you would think that uh, having an open hole would be, uh, would make the, uh, the cartridge susceptible to uh, going off in your pocket or your cartridge box or uh, absorbing uh, you know, moisture and things like that. But uh, this, this hole was big enough not to have the powder fall out of it, but just large enough to allow the flame from the cap to ignite it. Uh, it was a 54 caliber bullet. Uh, there are about five different models of this type of gun out there that were made between 1857 and, and 1865. Uh, they were used uh, a lot by the Union Army. Over 50,000 of them were produced. Uh, and they, uh, they bear a number of interesting uh, collectible uh, little facts. Uh, it's one of the only guns you'll ever find that was made in the state of Rhode Island. Oh. These were manufactured uh, in, in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, there are five different models. Uh, before we started filming, we were talking about certain 
reality television oh, shows yes. on uh, you know various <laughs> channels that will remain nameless. One of them had a uh, had a guy, a supposed Civil War firearms expert, <laughs> evaluating a Burnside carbine. Uh, he says, "Oh well, you know they made fifty thousand of those, and you know they're only worth twelve hundred bucks." Well, what he didn't tell the audience is there are five different models of this gun, and the one model that they were actually showing was not one of the models that was worth just 1200 bucks. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, there's, if you get a first pattern Burnside pre-war, you're talking thousands of dollars, not just tens of, you know, hundreds. <laughs> anyway, uh, and of course, the name, Burnside. Uh, he grew large, what they call back then, mutton chops. <laughs> that we now call sideburns. Sideburns. <laughs> uh, and that's exactly where that came oh, from, man. Ambrose Burnside. You ever wonder where something comes from? That's a great one. Where does the term sideburn come from? A guy named Burnside. Exactly. <sighs> and uh, he served, uh, in fact, we're coming up on the 150th anniversary mm. of his tenure as the uh, uh, commander of the Army of the Potomac. Uh, he took over for George uh, McClellan after uh, McClellan had been uh, some would say defeated, some say uh, fought to a stalemate at the Battle of Sharpsburg, Maryland in 1862. And it was Burnside who led the Army of the Potomac. Unfortunately for them, disastrous results at Fredericksburg in December. Uh, he was governor of Rhode Island, uh, but he's uh, held near and dear to all of our hearts as the uh, first president of the National Rifle Association of America in 1871. Wow, great! And the Burnside rifle, this the is carbine. A, yep. Wow, that is that's a lot of that's a lot of history into that one firearm, Phil. It, it is, and, and you know, a lot of times they say, "Well, if these guns could talk, yeah, what would they tell us?" Well, you know, just your average Burnside carbine can tell you tell you a great deal so about much, history. Wow, one one. Let's review one one firearm plant. Uh, governor, you said? Governor of Rhode Island. First president of the NRA, and, and, and an innovative, it doesn't get the props for that, it should, but an innovative firearm, pre-Civil War technology, but a whole bunch of really neat technology in that firearm. That's a good one. Phil, how are you going to top this? You know, you, you do this every time to yourself. Uh, you bring so much good stuff to the table, but you, you always seem to, to, to top it. I don't know how you do it. John, I've got a ringer for you that's coming up later uh, in the fall. And uh, we talked about it last week, and mm -hmm. I'll ask your audience again. Okay. You know, send in those cards and letters. <laughs> Tell us what you think the very first machine gun, full automatic machine gun in United States military history was, where it was used in combat for the very first time. And uh, talking about hiding in plain sight, Oh, uh, it, this is going to knock your socks off. Okay, so if you're watching this on Camera Company, you can send it back via TalkBack. I'll get it that way. Or send it to my email address, which is John Pop, J-O-H-N-P-O-P-P, -P -P, at nranews.com, and I'll get all your comments and your, and your answers right over here to Phil. Great. Phil, thank you so much. How can folks come and see a farm like this right here at the National Farms Museum? Well, they can see Burnside Carbines, uh, Gwyn and Yankins, uh, uh, Gwyn and Campbell's, Jenkins, Smith's, all kinds of Civil War carbines, Sharps and the rest of them, along with 3,000 other firearms on display daily. That's seven days a week from 9.30 to 5, just outside of Washington, D.C. on Interstate 66 in Fairfax, Virginia. Admission is free. There is plenty of parking. And if you can't visit us by coming off the interstate, visit us on the Internet at nramuseum.com. Phil, thank you once again for a wonderful episode of The Curator's Corner. Thank you, sir. Thank you, John.